In 2011, a revolutionary movement ignited across the Middle East. People cried out for freedom, democracy, dignity, and demanded an end to authoritarian rule and corruption. Determination and hope filled the air. We have an opportunity to build on this momentum. I'm 19 years old, okay? And I'm here to fight, to fight for my freedom and for my This was an extraordinary moment of history. There was no men, women, nothing about Muslims and Christians, nothing, everybody supporting everybody. As soon as this cause has finished, succeed, achieved, mission accomplished, then differences begin to come. Regimes held for decades crumbled. Others throughout the region watched with a wary eye. And women, who had stood shoulder to shoulder with men in the struggle for democracy, suddenly found themselves pushed aside when it came time to formulate new governments. Their voices silenced. This exclusion of women was not unique to the Middle East. Activists in other countries have had similar experiences. Men have a way of marginalizing women when the struggle has been won. Because for them, it's about power, and power need not be shared. So women have to organize, because when we are organized, we become a force. And women need to be clear about this. We need not just fight for democracy. We must fight for women's voices in democracy. A movement of democratization does not necessarily mean a movement that will include women in terms of equality in laws. President Hosni Mubarak has stepped down, bringing his 30-year rule to an end. These so-called revolutionary moments, that are moments of foundation of a new order, are very important in the sense that they offer an avenue of opportunities, they are very dangerous also. I voted in the election, but those who come to power forget about us. We wanted the revolution to produce freedom and dignity, but now we're back to square one. Decades of authoritarian rule stifled the development of democratic forces, leaving little opportunity for political organizing. Houses of worship, on the other hand, shielded by religion, thrived as centers of fundamentalist political activity. The progressive forces wanted a free democratic society, but they had really no experience of how to get there, how to make that kind of society happen. What are the basic uh, structures upon which such a society would be based? And no time. You can immediately make people go and drop a vote in a ballot box, but you don't have time enough to form the infrastructure so that that vote is thought out and decisions are made on the basis of the goals clearly stated. Determined to create a theocratic state, religious conservatives had the established networks, the organization, and the financial resources to quickly mobilize and fill the leadership void resources that were readily provided by other fundamentalist states in the region. They also had a very simple but important message. God is on our side. And a vote for us is a vote for Islam. We're here to apply God's Sharia. As long as we love God, we have to follow his Islamic law. I don't understand those who talk about meaningless philosophy and principles and other nonsense. Our demand is clear. It is to apply Islamic Sharia.
With a long history of rigged elections and the rapid emergence of new political parties, people turned to what they knew, what they felt they could trust, their religion, and the Islamists promised solutions to all of their society's problems. Consequently, they won elections in Tunisia, Egypt, and Morocco, putting them in charge of drafting new constitutions and laws that, once written, would be hard to change. Women in particular have a lot to lose if there are non-democratic, Islamic-oriented parties seizing uh, the power and imposing uh, rather than allowing a pluralist voice to be heard in the country, then what women have gained can be seriously challenged and in some cases withdrawn because rights that are given can easily be taken. When people are in opposition, uh, what they say and do is completely different when they are in power. When Khomeini, for example, was in exile, he kept saying that the clerics are not after state power. But of course, we all know what happened when he tasted the intoxicating taste of power. And they took control of every aspect of, not only the state, but every minute details of people's lives were dictated by the Islamists. The power of fundamentalist conservative forces has always been pushing back the rights of women. The women belong to the private space and men to the public space. They concentrate on complementarity, which means women are complements of the men, but not full independent human beings on their own. So they resent and reject anything that brings women to a position of equality. In the countries in transition, I think the role of women is a test because if you cannot see full equality for women, you may be sure that you can't see full equality for any minority. The Middle East North Africa region is comprised of many diverse countries with different economies, different governing and legal systems, different local cultures. But in nearly all of them, women do not have the same rights as men, either socially or legally. Historically, this was true across the globe. In Europe, women did not have the right to vote until the early to mid-1900s. In the United States, it wasn't until 1920. While many regions have made notable progress towards equal rights since then, most of the Middle East North Africa region has not. Advances in education and access to healthcare for women has not led to higher participation or higher representation uh, of women in politics and in, in the economy, where we know this is where the power uh, is. And so you are in a situation where patriarchy prevails, where institutions are patriarchal, governments are patriarchal. If you think about all this together, you realize how much women's lives, women's bodies are controlled by this patriarchal system. And nowhere is that more evident than in family laws. Heavily influenced by religious law, they determine nearly every aspect of a woman's life. The right to hold a job, even the type of job, the right to marry, the right to divorce, property rights, education, inheritance, child custody, even the rights to pass on her nationality, all in the name of custom and tradition. Islamist-inspired governments don't seem to have any trouble with laws changing as you become more modern and engage in an industrial and globalized world. So they change commercial laws, they change economic laws, they change laws regarding politics, but when it comes to women, suddenly it is only Sharia law that you have to follow, and Sharia law as interpreted 
by a certain very elite group of clerics. Contrary to the revolutionary calls for freedom and democracy, fundamentalists have been pushing to enshrine Sharia law into their new constitutions, further advancing the trend of using religion as a source of legislation rather than principles of equality and human rights. We have prepared a complete Islamic constitution, and it contains nothing else than Islam and it is not affected by Greek, Persian, or Indian philosophy. This not only threatens women, it also affects minorities and leaves legal interpretations to a small group of religious leaders. We have made many gains in the past era. We hope they won't be taken away from us, like the right to divorce. For many years, women suffered in courts. Why do they want to strip us of that right? Intent on turning back the clock, religious fundamentalists not only want to take away a woman's right to divorce, they're calling to reinstate practices like polygamy and female genital mutilation, practices that bring significant danger and harm to women. The rule that limited the number of wives to one is against Sharia law and it should be banned. I like Jalil's opinion about having not one wife, but two or three. I think this is right, because Sharia law says so. In Egypt, newly elected conservative Islamists are calling to lower the age of marriage for girls from 18 to as young as nine years old. Violence against women is very much linked to women's overall status in society. So it's not just the harm done, which the governments are very happy to accept as harm done because uh, they can be benevolent and find ways of preventing, protecting a woman from violence. But the challenge is to insist that it's not only a matter of harm done, but women's subordinated position is what is at stake here. So unless the patriarchal structures are challenged, women will always be a target of indiscreet forms of violence. We are stripped of our dignity when we use public transportation. It is used in every conservative societies to oblige women not to be part of the public life. Because if you are part of the public life, that means men can sexually harass you. Hundreds of protesters have gathered outside a central courthouse in the Tunisian capital, Tunis, to support a 27-year-old woman who has been accused of violating indecency laws after she was allegedly raped by police officers. The case has highlighted fears that the traditionally secular country could be falling under the influence of Islamist fundamentalists. Since the revolutions, acts of intimidation and violence against women in public demonstrations have increased across the region. Some have even been committed by government forces. This video shows a young woman being beaten and stripped by soldiers others by gangs of young men. A young student journalist was being subjected to the most horrendous sexual assault by a mob of men. And most are not prosecuted, sending a very troubling message that women in public are fair game, particularly women activists. It's totally obvious that some of them intend to scare women away from the square. Most of the time, they form a long chain, moving together, their hands on each other's backs like a train. They attacked the girls, they ripped their clothes off and sexually assaulted them. We went to rescue the girl. Suddenly all of them took out weapons, switchblades and knives, and those that didn't have weapons took off their belts to beat us with. We received a lot of reports about the incidents of sexual assault that are taking place and we believe that they are all executed in a similar way and we feel that the assaults are organized but that's not going to stop us from going to the square because we have to expose the people behind this.
In a societies like Libya, for example, and Syria now, women are raped, women are really victims, not only because they are citizens in a country that is facing a conflict, but also because they are women in this society. In Egypt, a whole group of women's rights activists have been fighting for many years to bring some marginal improvements to the legislation. They had, for instance, a success with the no-fault divorce, the Hul. However, these were appropriated by the ruling regime and they became Suzanne Mubarak's law and created what you might call a first lady syndrome so that the women's rights agenda became appropriated by the national machineries. So as a result, the detractors can now claim that these were simply the apparatuses of a corrupt regime. This is what happens with the backlash in terms of trying to disempower women, to tell them that they have no agency, that they don't make any difference, that they can't change their own lives. So denying those changes and denying the role of women in bringing about those changes is one of the strategies that they use. With the region's strategic location and abundance of oil, geopolitical issues have had a long, complex history, burdened with the legacies of colonialism and Cold War politics. Historically, international powers have focused on political stability and commercial interests, often at the expense of human rights and democracy. Then, in 2001, geopolitical concerns took on another dimension. After 9-11, national security became a number one concern, and human security became uh, marginalized. Uh, and women's groups, uh, women's rights issues, uh, particularly became targeted, not only because states' willingness uh, on this platform has uh, diminished or the priority has gone down, but the whole security discourse created new uh, hardline political actors to become more effective throughout the world. Women's rights issues and geopolitics may seem poles apart, but they're not. I think that a lot is going to be sacrificed and overlooked on the altar of geopolitics, by which I mean successor regimes in the MENA region. I think that as long as they toe the line of being market economies, following a broadly sympathetic agenda to the powers of the West, nobody will look very closely at what they do internally. And that puts struggling democracies and the future of minority and women's rights in jeopardy. International support makes a huge difference. If people around the world understand what is at stake, that women's role is completely interconnected with the possibilities of living in a modern and democratic society and a developed society with economic well-being, and that this kind of society is indispensable to peace and safety for everyone across the world. Activist Amal Abdel Hadi says it's time Egypt's majority population, women, get equal rights. No discrimination on any basis, not on gender issues, not on religious issues. The main challenge in Egypt is similar to other Arab countries where political Islam now holds power. These forces don't allow for a genuine participation of women. There is also the added problem that the Islamists have a wide community outreach, particularly in poorer areas, making women's participation especially difficult.
In Tunisia, fundamentalists try to include the concept of complementarity in their new constitution to legally define a woman's role in society. Activists, however, organized and defeated that measure. But in Egypt, women were blocked from the Constitutional Committee altogether in a power grab by Islamist parties. The way that the, the, the country has been ruled so far uh, did not really allow for strong participation or um, inclusion of women in decision making. We thought that with a, a new democratic Egypt, this would be over. And in Jordan and Morocco, countries that didn't experience regime change, women's rights activists have been seeking constitutional reforms for decades, only to face familiar resistance. Many of our recommendations were taken into consideration, but in the last moment, they remove one word, which was essential for women's rights, which is equality between all citizens, despite of their religious language or race or sex. They uh, 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 remove the word sex. And some of them, of course, they said, all citizens means all men and women in the country. But if it is the same, why you remove it? So it is really very worrying that the traditional powers are still trying to play this superiority of men over women in the society. But in Morocco, activists were able to counter long-held conservative religious arguments. Nous avons pu nous, nous fonder, nous baser, utiliser les lectures qui a été faites par d'éminents. We were able to utilize and base our case on interpretations made by eminent Muslim scholars who have proven that you can live in Muslim countries while being modern countries and still have access to fundamental liberties and rights. Their efforts resulted in reforms that not only guaranteed equality between men and women, but also stated that international law supersedes national law when it comes to these issues. The clear recognition within the Constitution that men and women are equal, particularly in the civil code, which is where individual liberties are determined, that recognition was a tremendous step forward for us. There is a political will. But also mobilizing the women's movement is very important. We know how to work together. And we also know how to build alliances and create strategies to be able to have an impact on the street and also on the decision makers. Achieving constitutional change was a huge success. But getting these rights implemented is still a challenge. And with Islamists winning recent elections, activists are certain to face more resistance. With the rise of the PJD, the situation of women will become even worse. We want moderates, but these Islamists are not moderate. They all hold extremist views on women. Donc c'est ça en fait ce qui est intéressant à observer actuellement au Maroc, c'est comment ils vont gérer ces contradictions. What's so interesting to observe currently in Morocco is how they will manage these contradictions between a constitution that clearly defines values and their own values, which are closer to Islam, cultural specificity, the family, and so on. I think they have to evolve because otherwise they cannot manage these contradictions and these paradoxes. Morocco has progressed. We cannot go back 20 years. So they will also have to evolve. RSS Chief Mohan Bhagwat has gone a step further. In a speech in Indore, he said that women must restrict themselves to household work. And in Madhya Pradesh, a BJP minister, Kailash Vijay Vargya, said, rape is punishment for women who cross the limits of decency. This shy eight-year-old girl has become the face of a national battle against extremist ultra-Orthodox Jews. Israel is outraged by the story of Nama Margolis, a second grade student who fears walking to her religious girls' school because of ultra orthodox radicals who have cursed and spat upon her for dressing in a fashion they consider immodest. The political field has changed because now there is a much stronger presence of religious radicalism. And uh, while we talk a lot about Islam, sometimes we forget about Christian radicalism with evangelical churches, on plural, with Catholic church, 
and with their sacred alliances in many issues and against, particularly when women's body and decision over her body is the target. What does that make her? It makes her a slut, right? After that huge firestorm developing after Rush Limbaugh's controversial comments on his radio show about a Georgetown student in the center of the battle over contraception and religious rights. Now we see in the United States with the rightist movement growing and putting down the issues of women's reproductive health, women's choices, and making most unbelievable statements to young women who never even knew that there were issues about use of contraceptives. They believed that that was a right that women had received and they would retain it forever. So we must have a place of defending what we have achieved. The structures of power, the way women have been treated, the way women have been positioned, is really very similar in spite of the differences in style and in implementation. And the only way that we can change that situation is by solidarity across borders, across religions, across cultures. Where is the women's voice to define a different understanding of religion? Now is the time. What is most important is to rebuild powers on the ground and to empower women and men who are really pro-democracy, who are really uh, fighting for their rights, to be united and to be working together to see some changes. Democracy is a work in progress and it needs support, especially in places where the forces against democracy are very well organized and very resource rich. So we need help to support the development of economic and social progress and skills building. I mean, I think all of these are issues that women have to be involved in. And that kind of thing is a lot cheaper than wars. It's a lot cheaper than any kind of uh, conflict. And uh, it's something that uh, is to the benefit of all. It takes years of working with local communities, doing building capacities on what is participatory leadership, what really is democracy, before you get to this moment where a group of women can actually visualize it as part of their lives, before uh, women would stop and say, well, you know what, um, I can't take abuse anymore, or I will not vote the way my husband wants me to vote. This is not a mechanical process. This is really breaking a vicious circles that have been passed on generationally and that are reproduced not only in the household, at schools, in the media. And we know that this is incredibly difficult. To get more women participating, what is required is pressure, mobilization, discourse, interactions, coalitions, to be active in syndicates, professional syndicates, labor unions, uh, media groups, whatever, uh, so that they are present there not just as women, but as women professionals in their own rights. So opening channels and getting alliances with men groups is quite critical. There is no escape from that. Otherwise, the women's movement will remain an isolated, excluded movement from the mainstream of political formations of the countries. Let us be honest and say that fundamentalists have invaded the virtual world way before us. So now more than ever it is important for us to be there, to be out there, making sure that this tool is accessible more and more for our own constituency and more and more for increasing that constituency. And we have to begin to link our absence from the democratic process with real outcomes in the lives of our people. In Nigeria, 60% of our women will give birth without a birth attendant. How is that possible 12 years into the democratic system that we have? We must link the absence, the inability of our government to address the needs of women to the fact that women are not there at the decision-making table. Women's rights should be institutionalized. Media, of course, plays a very important role in order to see the link between women's rights and human rights. Unless this link is made between women's rights and the rights of all citizens,
for a democratic state that respects everybody regardless of any differentiation, uh, the democracy will be truncated. It will be democracy for men and not democracy for women. And that's not democracy. Look at what has happened to the opposition movement in Iran. Now you have Iranian men who have finally understood that you cannot separate the issue of women's rights from the issue of democracy. But I wish that it wouldn't take 30 years of theocratic rule to get that simple message across to the other countries of the MENA region. Je crois que l'acte principal, c'est que nous considérons que notre cause est juste. Our main asset is that we consider our cause to be just. And when one is sure that one's cause is just, we can defend it to anyone. As I look into the future, I'm hoping that men will look into their hearts and that they would know that the democratic process has no value if women are not part of it. And therefore, they have to also extend themselves in order to build coalition with women so that through democracy that's built on equality between men and women becomes the real life of the people in the region. My great hope actually is no discrimination of any kind because it dehumanizes people and that every Egyptian feel an equal, useful, productive, powerful human being. It used to be said that Arab people were a resigned people, but they took to the streets, they protested. And I think all governments to come will have to take that into account. And we can only go forward. Despite the challenges, despite everything that's going on, I am certain that we will move forward. We're showing the children that they have a voice, they can be heard. Because a lot of them were always brought up as, no, you can't talk, no, we're scared, no, he's going to come after you. Now it's, we're pushing them uh, to have a voice and say what they think and say how they feel. My greatest hope is with a new generation. Because I think we now have a new generation that has been raised with expectations of having choice and having dignity. We will not be silenced and we will not be kept away. It's amazing what we're seeing here, because we never thought women would actually go out in Libya. Almost all of these women here are protesting for the very first time in their lives. We have seen them on television screens, on the internet. We have heard their voices and they do not want to be ruled in the manner of their parents' generation. We want to take this country into the future. We're not going to go back. Even if the men decide to give up, the women will continue with the revolution. We know our cause is just. We are committed. We are inspired. We will fight. And we will get our rights.